If you play video games, you're probably familiar with the idea of a loadout. The different combinations of equipment that are carried by different kinds of character classes. The knight carries a sword, the mage a staff, and all that sort of thing. And if you play historical video games like Mountain Blade or Holdfast or Napoleon Total War, well then if I were to ask you what the typical loadout of an officer from the 18th century would be, well it'd probably look something like this. A sword for melee, a pistol for ranged, and a spyglass, maybe even a horse to ride around on for commanding your troops. But as ubiquitous as this image is for pretty much any game involving, well, muskets, it really isn't very accurate. Unsurprisingly, the way in which officers were behaving on battlefields would typically look nothing at all like this, or like this, or even this. And the idea of a combat loadout isn't really the best way to think about 18th century officer equipage. So in this video, I'd like to explain why that is. Firstly, by looking at what officers really were carrying into combat, and much more importantly, by discussing how that equipment was actually being used. And now, just by way of a disclaimer, my focus is primarily in the British Army of the late 18th century, so most of this information is going to be grounded in their practices. Uh, most of the information is still going to be pretty broadly applicable across the entire early modern era. Just know that the further we're getting away from my specialty, well, the more addendums and exceptions there are always going to be. With that, before we get to the weapons themselves, let's just have a quick chat about standardization. Because a lot of what we imagine when we think about a class loadout really implies a level of military organization which mostly didn't even exist throughout the time period in question. When a man became an officer back in the day, he didn't just go to some government depot and get handed all of his equipment, the same across the board for every officer in the army. Instead, most of the clothing, the arms, and accoutrements of the officers were purchased privately. And now this isn't to say that every officer was just running around in whatever crazy getup that they thought looked the coolest. All throughout the 18th century, militaries were becoming increasingly professional, and a big part of that professionalization was the enforcement of standards of dress, grooming, and equipment. In the earliest iterations of these regulations, these decisions would take place at the regimental level, at which point it was up to the officer to procure everything according to the regimental regulations. So, you know, you had to go and buy your own coat, but you couldn't just buy a coat that looked however you wanted it to, it had to meet certain standards. And then as time progressed, more and more of those regulations are going to be enforced by central military authorities rather than by individual regiments. Basically, it's going to be the king, or rather his appointed ministers, rather than just the colonel who forms the regiment, deciding how those men are going to look. And these regulations would often be handed down through documents like the Royal Clothing Warrant of 1768, which dictated much of the general appearances of the British Army at that time. We'll look into some of the warrant's details regarding weapons a little later on. Still though, within these regulations, there were varying levels of room for personal embellishment and even improvements whenever they could be afforded by the officer in question. And again, we're going to come to all that as we discuss the equipment. Uh, so let's get started finally by looking at the melee weapons most commonly carried by officers. For much of the 18th century, a popular weapon for junior officers would be a spontoon or some other kind of polearm, a pike, for example. They were especially practical for easy identification on the battlefield, standing clearly above the heads of the men whom they commanded, as well as having a number of other practical functions, like helping the men to keep their dressing. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about polearms of all sorts, really, and their uses as tools of command, I actually have a video all about that topic, which I will link below. However, as time went by, and particularly in certain environments like in North America, polearms of all sorts were slowly falling out of fashion. They might be pretty, but they were also heavy and cumbersome in the field, particularly over the broken ground of the American colonies. Now, as late as 1768, it was still specified for battalion officers, read not grenadier officers or light infantry officers, to have espontoons. But whenever it wasn't deemed to be practical, they were basically just abandoned. 
in the American War of Independence, they were actually quite a rare sight in the British Army. So much so that by the end of the 18th century, going into the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, we would eventually see pole arms being abandoned by the officer classes, at least again in the British Army, um, and instead they would only be the purview of NCOs, primarily sergeants who would abandon their halberts for pikes. And this is all a good example of how just because something is in the regulations, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was actually the case. The regulation said that every officer in the army carried a, a spontoon, but they really weren't in North America, and shortly afterwards, that regulation was actually removed. Instead, many officers would have preferred to carry only their sword if they could help it, which again would be a private purchase tool and left up to varying degrees of personal preference depending on the precise situation that the officer was facing. Those being, you know, the year, the officers who were above them and how much they care, uh, where they were being deployed, and of course, if the sword was intended to actually see service, or if it was during peacetime and it was really just for parading, and plenty of other factors besides, of course. Now, ultimately, the Royal Clothing Warrant did prescribe the swords of each regiment to be uniform, and the sword knots of the whole to be crimson and golden stripes, the hilts of the swords to be either gilt or silver, according to the color of the buttons on the uniforms. So here we do have a regulation stating that all of the swords in a regiment need to look the same and be of certain colors and the like, but you can still see that wiggle room for at least individual colonels to dictate what they want their regimental pattern sword to actually be. And some of those colonels were doubtless more interested in the appearance of their men on parade rather than their function on the battlefield. And the result from all of that well, potential variance and lack of very clear uh, regulations was basically that there would be a general drive throughout the 18th century where officers and military theorists and all the like were encouraging a greater emphasis on the practical function to these weapons. They were encouraging frugality and whatnot. Uh, for example, one of the most famous military authors of the time period, Bennett Cuthbertson, would write in his Interior Economy of a Battalion of Infantry, published in 1779, that a corps of officers should be exceedingly exact and uniform in all their different appointments, particularly their swords, gorgets, spontoons, grenadier fusees, and accoutrements. All of which, though extremely neat, should never be too expensive, but rather calculated for real service than merely show. You know, if everyone was already following that very wise advice, he probably wouldn't have felt the need to write it down in his book of recommendation, which is basically what that publication was. It was Cuthbertson's view on how things in the army should be done, rather than how they always necessarily were. This would soon change, however, at least in the realm of swords, if not all the rest. See, by the time of the American War of Independence, infantry sabers were probably the most common sword type among officers. But shortly afterwards, in 1786, things would finally change for the British Army with the introduction of the Pattern 1786 sword, which actually was a standardized blade to be employed by infantry officers across the board. I mean, sure, everyone basically hated the thing and wanted their old sabers back, and the replacement model, the Pattern 1796, wasn't really all that much better, but hey, you know, at least it was the beginning of full standardization without all the vagueness of the system that existed beforehand. Although, even the Wikipedia article actually has a great example of how a lot of times people just left the things behind whenever they had the chance. And finally, probably the most important melee weapon that would be carried, well, nearly universally, really, by officers, would be their Exter Wallets, the very same company which oh so conveniently happens to be sponsoring this video. Oh, it's an impeccable cut, if I may say so, sir. No doubt you'll be the sharpest man on parade. Perhaps I may offer these wonderful gold buckles to complete the look? You know, I'm not sure. How much is all this running me again? Well, with your wonderful new gold buckles, plus chapeau, coat, um, yes, here we are, sir. Hey, 
Gad, sir, that's highway robbery. Don't you know who I am? The fifth newly commissioned lieutenant son of Lord such and such to pass through my shop today, sir? Oh, stuff it. All right, fine, you have your price, sir. Let me just fetch your ill-gotten bounty here. Oh, sir, no, 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 you don't mean to tell me that is your wallet, do you, sir? Hmm? What do you mean? Oh, such a hideous old bifold. Isn't that thing giving you back pain by now? No, no, no. Please, allow me to fetch you an improvement. Ah, yes, here we are. See how this strikes you. Oh, stop this silliness. You've already taken up enough of my... Oh, oh, my... It's so sleek and slim. It's so... it's so modern. What is this? Why, sir, this is an extra wallet. The best on the market, if I dare to say so. And they come in many different colors, patterns, to whichever style sir may prefer. Oh, well, yes, it's, it's very nice, but I could never take it on campaign. I'd lose the thing right off the bat. Oh, no, you wouldn't, sir. You see, it comes with a little solar-powered tracking device here. Just two hours in the sun, and you can track your wallet's location for up to three months using your phone. Heavens, but that's convenient. Oh, and that isn't all. Spy you that little button on the wallet's side. Uh, yes, that one. Impress upon it with your thumb, sir. Goodness me! This tiny little thing can carry up to 12 cards plus my cash on the interior? That's right, it's all thanks to that quick card access button. Oh well, it's all very nice, but my order's already too high. There's no way I could possibly afford this. Or rather, my patron, the good colonel, could afford this. Oh, I'm afraid sir is incorrect in this. You see, Exter is presently holding a special spring sale by which you might receive up to 30% off your order. Simply follow the link in the description down below and you'll find the details thusly. Why, that's just capital. I suppose I'll take it after all. You know, I, I don't actually know if the expression capital is appropriate to this time period. It might, might be more Victorian. Uh, it doesn't really matter. These ads always get a little silly anyways, and the voices always kill my throat by the end. What really matters, you follow the link for your discount, and as always, thank you to Exter for... Goodness me, that, yeah, it really does hurt. Thank you to Exter for sponsoring this video. Yeah, link in the description. You know how it goes. They're a great sponsor. I love them. Now let's return to the video. So now let's discuss ranged weapons, where the classic image of an officer in combat has him with sword in one hand, shooting a pistol with the other. And in many video games, the officer's pistol is one of his most important tools. It's how he's fighting and defending himself at range. Even in Napoleon Total War, you'll occasionally see the officers pull out a pistol to take a shot at the enemy. And yet, as common as that sight is, it's actually very inaccurate on a few different levels. Firstly, that infantry officers in the 18th century typically wouldn't even be carrying pistols at all. Uh, that's much more of a cavalry thing or a Victorian era with revolvers and the like. And odds are that unless they're, you know, really higher level officers who just want to have a fancy set of pistols for their own sake, of dueling or something maybe, well, they probably wouldn't even own one. There'd be no need to. It would be superfluous to the actual things, the actual baggage that's important to have on campaign. Not to say that officers never brought extra stuff, they actually brought a lot of extra stuff. But the point is, is that a pistol wouldn't be like, oh, an important tool of office, it would just sort of be a thing that they can carry with them. And, you know, yeah, sure, there might be a case out there, a few cases of, you know, an officer tucking a pistol or two under a sash to look cool, or maybe, yes, even using one in battle, but whenever that does happen, those are going to be the rare exceptions, not the general rule like it's often portrayed to be, at least, again, in the British Army. So then, in this case, well, what would officers be using for ranged combat? Well, actually, for the most part, they didn't. They wouldn't have any kind of ranged weapon at all, actually. One exception to that, of course, being officers in the American War of Independence who would often carry fusees. Now, a fusee is basically just a lighter, smaller musket that officers would, yes, sometimes purchase privately to carry if they desired, but they weren't really being regulated like the swords would have been. Sometimes they had sights, sometimes they didn't, sometimes they could fix a bayonet or not. 
But the thing is, is that even if we have a situation like the American war where a lot of those regulations are being played with a little more than maybe they would be over in Europe, even if an officer did go out and purchase privately his own firelock to, to have in battle, more often than not, odds are he's not actually going to be using it. He's never going to fire it. It wasn't even uncommon for an officer to, yes, on the one hand, carry a fusee, but to not actually have any ammunition for it. They were more being carried as a way to blend in with the rest of their men from a distance. You know, what with the pesky reputation of American sharpshooters at the time. This practice, alongside a few other little adaptations, are discussed at great length in the amazing book With Zeal and With Bayonets Only by Matthew Spring, where he writes, Although British regimental officers would have retained their scarlet rather than brick red coats and their epaulets and swords, they appear to have stripped the metallic lace from their buttonholes and hats, laid aside gorgets, and possibly also their crimson sashes, and, like the sergeants, taken up fusees. These sensible measures probably enjoyed some success. After the Battle of Long Island, Captain William Dancy reported with relief that the threat the rebel sharpshooters posed was not so dreadful as I expected. Though, as he later added, such a bugbear were they at first that our good friends thought we were all to be killed with rifles. Interestingly, when Simcoe was wounded and captured in October 1779 during the Queen's Rangers' raid into New Jersey, he heard one rebel regret that he had not shot him through the head, which he would have done had he known him to be a colonel, because he thought all colonels wore lace. Okay then, so what would officers be doing at range? They, they don't have pistols, they're carrying fusees sometimes that they're not even bothering to use. Well, how are they going to defend themselves in a firefight then? Well, to put it simply, they didn't. I know it really flies against that usual image, and it might, yes, make playing the officer in the video games a little less exciting, but really, if an officer has to even think about defending himself really in any capacity, well then something has possibly already gone wrong for him. And actually, much the same can be said for melee weapons as well. If an officer is out there using his sword or his spontoon or a bayonet on the end of a fusee, whatever, to individually duel with enemy musket men, well then, things have probably already gotten pretty bad for him. That isn't typically supposed to happen. The officer's role in combat isn't to fight, it's to command. It's to direct his men to control these massive formations of musket men in the chaos of battle, where the field is totally obscured by smoke. In these alien, cataclysmic environments, it was up to the officers to dedicate all of their faculties to maintaining situational awareness, to listen out for commands, to issue their own commands, to keep track of where their men are and where they are going. I mean, coordinating a line of 50 men is difficult enough in any circumstances, let alone when you can't even see the enemy that's pouring 70 caliber lead balls into you and you need to be listening out for drum and bugle calls to even figure out where you're supposed to be going. The officer's weapon, then, isn't there to fight anything. It's meant as a tool for organization, as a device by which he might immediately be recognized at a distance by his allies, although we saw earlier that sometimes you don't want to be recognized, and in which case a different kind of weapon would serve that same function as well, and they're really only ever being used as an absolute last resort, or admittedly, yeah, like if you actually meet the enemy in a bayonet charge, which is pretty rare, usually one side breaks before the other, well, in which case, if you're really in the thick of it that way, then yes, you can use your sword. But again, especially at range, you're not supposed to be thinking about defending yourself. They have a more important job to do. It was the responsibility of the private to handle his firelock according to the exercise and to run smoothly through the firings, while it was the responsibility of the NCOs and the officers not to fight, but to make sure that the private was able to carry out his duty to its greatest possible effect. Now, all that being said, obviously we are talking about a very broad topic here, and absolutely there were instances of officers getting into the fray themselves. 
and in the case of the American War of Independence, for example, actually firing their fusees in battle, as written again in With Zeal and With Bayonets Only. Considering how, as we have seen, 18th century officers often carried spontoons, or less commonly in Europe, firelocks, in addition to their swords, one might have expected that they would have fought alongside their men in action. As Mark Odense has convincingly demonstrated, however, in America this does not appear often to have been the case. For example, when Brigadier General Alexander Leslie wrote to his brother about the death of Captain the Honorable William Leslie at Princeton, he reassured the Earl, I don't find he was too rash, as you seem to fear, or that he was out of the ranks. More explicitly, after the Battle of Monmouth, Lieutenant Hale regretted the fact that he and three brother officers of the 2nd Battalion of Grenadiers had recklessly outpaced their companies during the initial breakneck British advance. Hale shamefacedly added, I am told the general, i.e. Clinton, has expressed his approbation of the ridiculous behavior of the four subaltern officers who had got foremost. That Hale took especial notice of the fact that one of his brother officers had dispatched a rebel with his sword during the pursuit, as we all might have done, demonstrates that engaging in personal combat was an unusual exploit for an officer. Similarly, contrary to the recommendation of one officer and military writer who served in Britain, firelock armed officers and sergeants in America were not encouraged to augment the battalion's fire in action. At the opening of the Albany expedition, Burgoyne reminded his army that the attention of every officer in action is to be employed in his men, to make use of a fusee except in very extraordinary occasions of immediate personal defense would betray an ignorance of his importance and of his duty. And if you're interested in seeing more examples of men firing their fusees, being censured for it, and really any other question or element of British uh, doctrine during the American War of Independence, well, I will link the book down below. It, it really is an amazing read if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, but in any case, this duty, th this element of command and control, it's by far the most important part of infantry combat once you get to any meaningful scale, at least. And yet, it's also largely neglected, even absent from many video games and films and, yes, even reenactments. And that's often through no fault of their own. It's simply because these mediums are failing to capture what that meaningful scale and the chaos of battle really was like. Unfortunately, though, once you remove those elements, it's easy to lose sight of what the role of an officer really was, and just how difficult it was for them to enact that role. So much so that them discharging a weapon wasn't only unnecessary in real combat, but it was often actually looked down on as something actively irresponsible. And that's not for any reasons reflecting, you know, social differences or fake ideals of so-called polite warfare. It was, in fact, for purely practical reasons. Now, thank you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this quick little video, and if you're interested in learning more, well, like I said, I'll be sure to link plenty of videos and other sources besides down below that you may be interested in. Uh, as well, you can visit my website, nativeoak.org, where in the library section, you'll find a PDF library of all sorts of different primary sources from the 18th century that you can read all free of charge, uh, including, for example, that Cuthbertson book, which is basically a giant guide of recommendations for how an army ought to be run. It's a really good way to learn a little bit more about the ins and outs of, uh, well, the interior economy of a battalion of infantry. Now this video was made in support of the Native Oak, where 10% of all of our profits go to charities which help to promote the study of history through museums, reenactment societies, and restoration projects, as well as more general good causes, things like, you know, veterans' causes and homelessness charities and all the rest. Again, you can learn about all of that by visiting nativeoak.org, and again, your viewership is very much appreciated because it is helping all of that as well as, well, myself. A special thank you is owed as ever in that light to my generous supporters on Patreon, without whom none of my work would be possible. And until the next time, to all of you, my dear viewers, I am, and I hope I shall remain, 
your most humble and obedient of servants.